Have you ever thought, there must be more to life than this? It might have been when your kids were little. I remember when our kids were very, very little, and Megan felt like the first two months of their lives, she'd never even got dressed. You know, just one thing after another. Endless diapers, little people who need something for you, lack of adult conversations, there must be something more. Uh, Or maybe you've said it when you were at work and you got the promotion and it didn't really change much. Or maybe you said it when you retired and uh, you got to do everything that you wanted to do when you wanted to do it. And after a while you were like, well, that was great, but there's got to be something more. I always have a sense that there's something more out there, uh, generally in a good way. And I believe that collectively we sense that there is more out there for us as a church. There are more people who need to know Jesus. There are more people that you've been praying for, people that you invited over Christmas. There are more needs that can be met in the world. There's just more. And so one of the questions that we're going to wrestle with these first two months of the year is, what do we need to, be, to do to be ready to be used by God as a church and as individuals? And so we're going to look at the sermon series on mission. And we're going to be inspired, I hope, by the first followers of Jesus. Because the first followers of Jesus lived a radically different lifestyle. They had a deep sense of purpose. They had a deep uh, contentment that came from the way that they lived their lives, and they ultimately changed the world. So we're going to look at how they did that through the book of Acts. So if you will look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1 with me. Luke writes, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit." Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So the first thing that I just want to note is that this is a two-part story. Uh, Luke begins with saying in my first account, Theophilus. Theophilus is the person he's writing to. And what he is referring to is the Gospel of Luke. So Luke writes two parts. The first is Jesus' life, and then the second is the implications of Jesus' life, and that's what we're going to look at in uh, Acts today. So I want to make a couple of points out of this text as we look at being on mission. The first and the foremost is the reality of Jesus. Jesus, as God, has come into our world, and he's come into our world with a very specific purpose— He hasn't come into our world to be mad at us. What he's come into our world to do is to fix it. He sees our brokenness. He sees that the system is broken, and he sees that we are broken, and he enters into our world to fix it. Now, we've just finished celebrating Christmas, and Christmas is all about how God enters into the world, and in his plan and his purpose. Christmas is all about joy and hope and the promise of peace and what God is doing in the world. And so now we fast forward in Acts to the other end of the story, because he says in verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. What he's talking about there is the crucifixion. So after Jesus has come and he's uh, born, God among us, he's lived a perfect life, he dies on the cross for our sins, and then is raised by the power of God on the third day. 
So after he has done that, after he's been raised from the dead, he has these resurrection appearances over a period of 40 days, and he speaks about the kingdom of God. So I think he's doing a couple of things. One is he's filling in the blanks. Because if you have walked through with some of the preaching that we've done here, read the Gospels, you know that quite frequently the disciples don't get what's going on. And so they, they have the crucifixion, the resurrection, and I think Jesus is filling in the blanks. But the most important thing that's happening here is that everything about the Jesus story, everything about God's plan to redeem people and to reconcile everything back to himself, everything about that rests on the resurrection. If we don't have the resurrection, then everything else is just a nice moral story. But the resurrection demonstrates that everything that Jesus said and does is true and that God has, has made it true by the resurrection. So everything rests on that. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, as the Apostle Paul says, we are foolish people. And so he spends time convincing them that he is alive, and that what he says is true. And the disciples become utterly convinced of the reality of this. And that's really the starting point of them being on mission and of us being on mission, being absolutely convinced of the reality that Jesus is risen from the dead. If you walk through the early church, you see these, this group of 12 people who for the longest time had the hardest time just figuring out what was going on. Most of them die terrible deaths as martyrs. Every one of them gives up everything to follow Jesus. And it happens over and over and over again in concentric circles. I mean, you, you can barely get people to show up for a dinner party, let alone give their lives to some cause. And so this was something that they were utterly convinced was real. God had come among them. Jesus was alive, and everything then was changed. That's where they begin, and that's where we have to start, that Jesus is risen from the dead, and everything then is different. One of the things that I note with some interest, and I haven't fully formed all of my thoughts on this, but I look at the fact that I think we're in kind of a post-Christian uh, era um, the, the church is no longer synonymous with the state. Most people don't go to church anymore. Um, and there, there, I think there's a good and a bad for that. It makes life a little bit more difficult for us. But I also think that there's, there's a good part about that because it really makes, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to do it not because there's cultural pressure, not because it's good for business, which it used to be. I mean, you needed to belong to a church in order to have standing in the community. None of those things count or people care about them anymore. You come to church, you decide to follow Jesus because you become utterly convinced that Jesus is alive and he's changed your life. And I'm not sure that's bad for the church. If when the church gathers on a Sunday morning, it is the community of people who know without a shadow of a doubt that they have been changed, that God is alive. I think that's good. It helps us to focus the reality that Jesus is alive and among us. The second point that I want to make is the importance of waiting for the Holy Spirit. Luke writes, don't, uh, quoting Jesus, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised which you've heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So don't just rush out, wait for the Holy Spirit. And why does Jesus want his followers to wait for the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit brings God's guidance. The Holy Spirit brings God's wisdom. The Holy Spirit brings God's insight. And he wanted to, his earliest followers to have all of those things because they were going out into uncharted territory. They had no idea what things were going to look like, and they were going to need those things in order to be successful. Now, we already have the Holy Spirit. We don't need to wait because it has already come. It was given at Pentecost. When we come to Jesus, we, we get the Holy Spirit. But we still need to pay attention to this caution of Jesus is so that we can go through a process of discernment. Whenever we're going to make big choices for our lives or for direction in mission or ministry or for our church, the questions we need to ask are not, do I like this? Will this make me happy? Is this convenient? The questions that we need to ask are, is God in this? Is this what God is calling us to do? Is this where God is leading? 
Because those questions, guided by the Holy Spirit, will take us to an entirely different place. And I love later on in Acts, uh, quoting Paul, uh, he says of some decision that they have decided to make. Paul says, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. And I think that's the discernment that Jesus wants us to have. It seemed good to me, but it also seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And we're only going to move forward if we have both of those things. Another caution that's in there is don't get ahead of God. And that doesn't mean don't do anything. That doesn't mean, don't, that doesn't mean be so safe that you, know, you take little timid steps. I mean, we're called to boldness. But it's basically to say don't go off in the wrong direction uh, because it's possible. So make sure that you are going where God is leading and following in his footsteps. Wait for the Holy Spirit. And it's also in a very meaningful way the Holy Spirit coming on them is the empowering of them to do their jobs, which is to witness to Jesus. Now, the third point comes along with this not getting ahead of God or not going in our own direction, and that is, remember the danger of getting sidetracked. Verse 6, they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That has been an enormous concern of theirs, and Jesus keeps saying, no, 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 no. You know, my kingdom is not of this world. No, I'm not going to do that. And they just keep going back to this thing. And for them, it's not a secondary issue. It is of primary importance. I mean, every patriotic Jew wanted the kingdom to come back again, to the Davidic kingdom to be stored. This is a very front and center cultural issue. But Jesus says to them, the cultural issue is not your issue. The cultural issue is not my issue. I mean, think about this. Jesus says to them, wait for the Holy Spirit. You're going to get discernment. I'm going to send you out. Big things are going to happen. And the disciples are still way back at, but do we get our own king? It's so easy to get sidetracked. And if you don't keep the main thing the main thing, you will begin chasing after other things that are important. We hardly ever spin our wheels on something bad. What we do is we spin our wheels on something that's not quite as important. And oftentimes it's because it's easier. Don't get sidetracked because it's so easy to get sidetracked. I look at the, the landscape of churches in America, and I'm not only am I widely read, I sit on boards, I do all kinds of things, I have a fairly good idea of what is going on out there. Every single church that I have ever come across was planted with the hope and desire of reaching people for Christ. I don't care if they were on the conservative end of the spectrum or the liberal end of the spectrum. Believe it or not, liberals want people to know Jesus too. Every church I have ever known was planted with the goal of reaching people for Christ, developing disciples, and making a difference in the world. And I would say 97% of them, somewhere along the line, got sidetracked on other important issues. Got to keep the most important issue the most important issue. The fourth thing leads out of that is we need to understand the call. We have a call as people. The church has a call. Jesus said to them in verse 7, It's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by owner's authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Don't worry about that thing. That's out of your control. God will do what God will do. No matter what the newspaper said, no matter who wins the election in 2020, God is still in control, and God will do what God is going to do. You do what God is calling you to do, and what you are going to do is to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Okay, not literally. You're going to be witnesses in Gig Harbor and Tacoma and Port Orchard and Pierce County, and King County, and Washington, and the United States. 
That's what we are called to do. The call underlines what's important to them. The political stuff, sure it's important, but it's not the most important thing. Jesus says the most important thing is receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and going and being witnesses. You will receive power. To do what? To be a witness. That's what the power comes for. A witness to what? A witness to the fact that Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead. You will receive power to share about the fact that Jesus is alive, and that changes everything. Witnesses are people who have seen something. So the question is, what have you seen? The question is not, what did Billy Graham see? The question is not, what did the pastor see? The question is not, what did your Christian hero see? The question is, what did you see? Because that's what God is calling you to be a witness about. Not what somebody else saw, but what you saw. What's your experience with Jesus? That's the story. Many of you were set free from bondage to different things. Many of you, many of us, were going down the wrong road. And God stepped in and changed the trajectory of our lives and we are healthier, and we are better, and we have a sense of peace, and we have a sense of joy, and we are rooted in the reality that no matter what we go through, God is present with us. That's the story that you tell. And the promise of Jesus is, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Witnesses are people who've seen something, so share what you've seen. And the fifth point is my favorite point. Don't just stand there. I mean, I love this. This is what I love about the Bible. It is so real. I mean, you have this picture of Jesus being taken up into the clouds, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And so what do you do when you look up? This is universal. Everybody goes. And so I have this picture of all the disciples standing there. And then all of a sudden, there are two angels. And this doesn't really come across in, in, the, in English, but I'm quite sure what the angel says is, you guys are idiots. Why are you standing there with your mouths open? <laughs> Go do what he just said. That's, that's the message of the angels. You heard what he said. Don't just stand there with your mouth open, staring off into the middle distance. Go do what he said. Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus, and here's the promise, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him get to heaven. So if the angels were standing in this room and were looking at you, thankfully most of you have your mouths closed, um, what would they say to you? What have you heard? What can you do? Where can God deploy you? Wouldn't that be an interesting question to start the week with? God, where can you deploy me this week? So let's back up a step. Jesus sends us out, tells us to tell the story of what we've seen. We get the message of the angels. Don't just stand there. Go out and do what you've been told to you. How do you figure out what you're supposed to do? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I've got a couple of answers to that. The easiest one is, I don't know where I got this idea, and maybe you had this idea too, but from earliest ages, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I had this deep sense that he was going to call me to do something I didn't want to do. You know, I was just really afraid that if I said yes to Jesus, I was going to have to do something I didn't want to do. What I've discovered is, Jesus generally wants to give us the desires of our hearts. And sure, sometimes we're stretched, and, you know, I mean, life is life. you got to do stuff you don't want to do. But by and large, I have found that Jesus calls us into the areas of our interest. Jesus calls us into the areas of our giftedness. So if you want to know where God is deploying you, what do you care about? Write down a list of three things. These are the things that are really important to me. I love doing this, I like doing that, and this is important to me. Make a list, and it could be that those are the things that God will use you for and deploy you in the area. 
The next question that you might ask yourself is to look around and go, what needs to be done? And maybe if you have noticed what needs to be done, maybe God is calling you to do that. And as you try to figure those things out, we want to help. We want to discern with you. We want to be there together with you. So call us, talk to us, text us. We would love to help you discern where God wants to deploy you at whatever stage of life that you're in. And then there's an easy one, I think, for all of us, the way that God wants to deploy us and use us. Christianity did not spread because of the great brains spreading great ideas. It certainly happened. But in the initial stages, people became Christians because they saw their neighbors behaving differently, and they were attracted to what they saw. The early church wasn't just a bunch of people who were talking to people about Jesus. They were a community that was living in a very different way because they bought into this radical idea that Jesus was alive, it changed their behavior. And their neighbors watched them being kind to the poor. Their neighbors watched them looking after the sick. Their neighbors watched them working in education. And then when they heard the stories about Jesus, they looked at their neighbors and said, no wonder you live like this. This is because of what God has done. It was the community that attracted people to Jesus. And it's actually one of the places that I think we are at in a great place in our society. Because when it came to church, it used to be that you had to believe in order to belong. And now what we're finding is that people want to belong before they believe. We get people who are much earlier in their spiritual progress, and they're drawn to churches, they're drawn to our church because they see the difference in our lives. I would say close to 90% of the people who come to visit our church, who stop and talk to me at the Have We Met table, when I ask them what drew you, I usually ask them, how did you hear about Harbor Covenant? And it's either so-and-so invited me or we looked at the website. And then I asked, why did you decide to come? 90% of the people say, because you're involved in the community. We looked on your website, and we see how you serve, and they want to be a part of that. They may not be down with the Jesus thing yet, but if they come and they see the character of our community, the way we love not only one another, but the way we love everybody that God calls to us, that begins the process of them seeing that this faith thing is real. And we are in a very similar situation with the early church now. People in our culture have a very minimal idea of what this whole Jesus thing is about. They don't know the stories. They don't know who Abraham is. They don't know that Luke wrote two books. I mentioned that, and most of you went, well, duh. But I would bet that most everybody who comes on our doors has absolutely no idea that Luke wrote two books. They have no idea that Luke wrote one book. They have no idea who Luke is. They have very, very minimal idea about this whole Jesus thing. And so we have to show them. And they, they get an idea of what Jesus is like by looking at how our lives are different. And so... It, If you believe, as I do, that from the very beginning when we went our own direction and God set about reclaiming us and making the world new, if if you're with me in the fact that the purpose of Jesus and the purpose of God is to put everything right again, then we need to care about putting things right too. And if we don't care about putting things right, then people won't hear the gospel. People won't see the point. And that's why I think a lot of people look at church as being completely irrelevant to their lives because they're not seeing how the gospel is putting things right in people's lives and in our communities. The last thing that they get left with is the promise of his return. And the idea is that this is a, this is a period of time where we have an opportunity to go and share our stories, to live in transformed ways so that everybody can see. And I think about the fact that every week, right before the sermon, 
the last thing we do is we pray the Lord's Prayer. And there's a line in there that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer, but it's also a commitment. Because we are actually praying there that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would help us fulfill the call that he has given us, which is to go into all the world and share the gospel. Because that's what fixes things. And the more people come to know Jesus, the more communities of Christ that are developed, the more the kingdom advances, the more earth begins to look like heaven. Now, I'm not talking about some utopian vision here. Don't get me wrong. If you sit here long enough, you have known that my, my thesis is that we don't all just depart to some other place and this all burns. I stick with Revelations chapters 20, 21, and 22, where the new heavens and the new earth are here, and God recreates everything here, and Jesus comes down here to live with us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's our prayer of commitment. We're not powerless. We're not doing it on our own. And Jesus promises us several times the Holy Spirit. But there are some other clues in the text of what we get about how we will have power and how we are working together with God in this process. So it says that they're standing there and all of a sudden, Jesus is taken up into the clouds. You picture cumulonimbus, right? You know, or something like that. That all of a sudden, on this perfectly blue, cloudless day in Palestine, Israel, all of a sudden, one big puffy white cloud descends from heaven. And it already has a harp on it ready for him. And Jesus steps onto the cloud and begins to play the harp and goes up into heaven. This is not what's, what we're talking about. And we're not talking about, you know, a primitive understanding, you know, the heaven is up there and hell is down there and we're in the middle. The cloud is the presence of God. The cloud happens, Jesus is caught back up into the presence of God because the clouds in Scripture always mean the presence of God. You go back to the, uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments. Moses is on Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. What happens to the mountain? A cloud descends on it. It's not that the weather gets bad. It's that God shows up. The cloud is a sign of the presence and the glory of God. The tabernacle in the wilderness, as they're being led through into the promised land, when Moses goes into the tabernacle, a cloud descends on the tabernacle. It didn't just get cloudy that day. God was there. When Jesus is on the Mount of the Transfiguration, there is a cloud, the presence of God. And so it's to remind us that Jesus is going back to God. God is present there. And Jesus doesn't rise off on a puffy white cloud. Jesus is enfolded into the glory of God. But there's another picture that's going on there. And I find this even more compelling. Maybe, maybe the right word is I find this even more exciting. Because there's another echo of a fairly obscure passage in the Old Testament. So there are several significant prophets in the Old Testament. And two of them are Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is about to go to God. He's one of the two people in the Old Testament who don't die. They just go up into heaven. And Elisha is his successor. And they go off together because Elijah knows he's going to be taken up into heaven. And what Elisha wants is a double portion of the spirit that Elijah has. And Elijah says, if you see me being taken up into heaven, you will receive a double portion. There's that echo in Jesus being taken up in the transfiguration. Elijah is taken up, Elisha sees it, Elisha gets a double portion. The disciples are gathered around, Jesus is taken up into heaven, and they get far more. Jesus himself says, you will do greater things than me. It's that echo of the double portion. And you will do it because you have seen me, 
You're my witnesses, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit. So three things I want you to think about for a moment. The first is, where do you sense your mission field is? Second, what tools do you need to be better prepared? That might be as simple as, I really just need to write down the ways that God has worked in my life. Or I need to pray more. We, we've talked about this before, that uh, to take opportunities. People share something good, offer to pray. People sh share something bad, offer to pray. What tools do you need? I need to be more confident in praying. Number three, what's the biggest thing that distracts you from mission? Let's take a few moments and let's pray about those things. Loving God, as we stand at the beginning of this year, we're aware of the end of last year, and most of us are tired. And so it's, it's kind of hard to think, maybe, about moving forward. And it would be easy to just forget about this amazing truth that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, that God loves us so much that he sent his Son to come into our world, to live a sinless life, to die on the cross, to be raised by the power of God, to change our lives, to form new communities, to transform the world, to transform us. It would be easy to forget that, and yet it's the most amazing truth we know. So God, help us to keep the main thing the main thing. Help us to look for the ways that you are calling us. Holy Spirit, would you empower us to be witnesses to the things that we have seen? Would you open up our eyes to the call that you've given us in the mission field that we have? And would you empower us to be able to do the things you call us to do? Holy Spirit, would you come into the lives of the people that prayed to ask Jesus to be real to them? And would you convince them without a shadow of a doubt that he is alive? In Jesus' name, amen.